We are live. Welcome to another edition of the Style and Vibes podcast. Today, I am joined by my good friends again, Carrie Ann Reed Brown, executive producer and host of Carry On Friends podcast, and Chris Williams, editor. I always I mess up your title you now. More I call it editor and chief and publisher. publisher. You just run things around and wear it at magazine. I'll <laughs> take it. Editor. You said crossword editor. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like you said crossroad editor. I don't know. This is listen. I don't know what you said. <laughs> associate editor. Not uh, no, I so actually associate, associate publisher. publisher. Associate yes, publisher. associate okay. publisher. Yeah, yeah. No, nah, it's all good. It's listen. Okay. Same difference. We're at claim it. Yeah. All right. And associate publisher of Where It's At magazine, <laughs> among other things. Come, can't read our fear list of entrepreneurial endeavors because the list just go on. Can't true we are yadi. We have enough title around here, but. You know, speaking of Yadi, I think this is going to be a fun episode. We're back to talk music again. Um, for those who do not know, uh, hip hop as a genre is celebrating its 50th year as a genre. This will be like my first time celebrating this monumental, I don't remember 25. So I think 50 is a good number. Um, and they kicked off the year, a lot of like radio stations, um, foundational artists have already been like promoting. This is the year of 50 of we we've seen it at the Grammys. We're seeing it and play out in like concerts and festivals. Um, but I thought, you know, we're based here in New York. Um, I got the inspiration for this episode as I was, I always listen to the radio in the morning as I'm bringing Sinai to school. And um, I usually listen to Hot 97's Ebro in the morning with Laura and Rosenberg and Shani Culture. Um, and they are doing a playlist celebrating um the top 50 songs in hip hop history. So you know that that list is always gonna be controversial. So every week they pick two songs in a particular era, era or genre, part of the genre um, throughout history. And it has to have like different um, criteria of longevity. It has to be, you know, popular over, it has to carry over time. Um, so they're maybe about midway through their list and they, they're, they're clearly having fun bantering and the guests also, uh, the listeners really get to chime in because they get to vote on it. So I think it's a fun conversation to have. At the end, they'll have this really good playlist of not just the top 50 picks, but all of the songs um, that they all submitted. So it's five of them submitting two songs and then the listeners get to vote. But I keep thinking, I'm like, we should really have a discussion about Caribbean culture, particularly Jamaican music culture and its impact in the relationship between hip hop and reggae and dancehall. Um, we have all come up in, you know, the time frame of really seeing how that has evolved, not only just from an artistry standpoint, but as a genre. So I think that there are, are just so many things that we could talk about to really um, impact, to talk about the impact that Jamaican music culture has really played into and is part of that foundation setting. So I think, you know, I sent you guys, you know, a few topics to really cover, but I think I really want to start by talking about the location, right? New York is, is a place of melting pot of culture. So I think that New York really has had the prime opportunity to really bring together these cultures specifically um, because there were so so much migration happening, not just in this time frame, but um, even earlier. So what do you think that New York as a city really, how, how did New York play a part in this perme permeation of, of Jamaican culture and dancehall culture from you, your guys' perspective. I'll give it over to Carrie first and then to Chris. 
I think it's important to note that at this time in the late 60s, early 70s, that's when we saw the largest influx of people from the Caribbean moving into the US, in the New York, Miami, those areas. And so it just made sense that as the migration numbers grew, the influence was going to grow. There's numbers that support just the volume of people who are flowing into the city. And um, I think that had a really huge impact. And in addition to that, you know, those who were here from the 60s, their kids are now born growing up in the 70s and coming out of Caribbean households or Jamaican households and, you know, bringing some of that vibe and that element into their New York scene and culture. And and it, I'll add to that, Carrie, you know, even seeing when you think back, because I remember where it's at, did uh, a piece on DJ Cool Herc. So, you know, when you say hip hop 50, you're talking actually the year I was born, which is 1973. And, you know, big up your earth. <laughs> yeah, my, yeah, my. And, you know, during that during that time, you know, um, you know, uh, the Bronx was burning kind of thing. Right. You know, so it was, it was, that was the, the, the overarching theme and reality of what was happening. And so, you know, out of that was born, you know, these different parties, these, these, these parties that were out sort of in the street in, in, in buildings that were kind of falling apart, but standing still, you know, um, and, and people were doing some innovative things with music and then you had your cool Herks and 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 your your Africa Bambadas and and all these other guys who you know uh, you know who were doing innovative things with the music, but cool Herc being Jamaican and knowing about toasting and understanding what dance hall what we did in the dance halls actually not dance hall as a genre but in the dance halls in Jamaica you know with you know, with toasting and and sort of incorporating all those elements into the music really helped to create a unique sound and a feel. Um, and, and, and so I feel like hip hop and, and Caribbean culture are permanently married, you know, they, because they foundationally, they grew up together, mm -hmm. you know, so you, you can't separate them, you know, go ahead. They, so. they share a DNA. Yeah. Yeah. They, they share a yeah. DNA. Um, the, the idea of even how it was started, right? It's, you know, a lot of don't push me. There's a party aspect of it, but you know, um, the message, right? Dance hall was mostly talking about the sufferation and all of these things and, you know, mixing in, it, it was just such a, a, a timing. And the, the, the block parties and everything that was, I was telling Michaela that the parties that were happening outside were a replication of what was happening at nighttime in the dance halls or the lawns in Jamaica, as we call them. And um, for clarification, when when if you heard heard like early seventies dance hall and say you know when them said in a lawn, it didn't mean a physical lawn in front of the house. It's it's an enclosed space. It's open air and where they had parties. And so a lot of that energy and vibe they brought to the daytime because it was you could get away with a day party in New York as opposed to having that kind of energy at night in New York. I think additionally, you brought up Cool Herc and the idea of how he 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 really his dad had a record shop. And that's where he really honed his understanding of music. And then because he had all of these records that maybe they weren't as popular. And for the most part, even in Jamaica, right? The the sound at the time is R&B from the States. It's mu international music that they're using to, to break and cut on records in between one another before production was holistically done in the studio. The idea of toasting over a rhythm or a version is what, you know, them call it. The version is the instrumental and not, it wasn't just that toasting sound that they brought in terms of speaking 
to the crowd, but also that idea of mixing between turntables because it was finishing, right? So they wanted to keep the versions going. So they switched from one to the other in order to not stop the music essentially and a lot of those records at the time were older r&b records and so when you think about or current r&b records pop records whatever was on in the island i think miss pat talked a lot about her distribution of records in in our episode you know a while back um, and she talked about distributing records all across the island. And so that's what we had access to at the time. So even taking that R&B sound and putting it on to record in front of a crowd and continuously playing a version so that people could come and intertwine and share whatever they were hype about talking about, that um entire setting really translated to the Bronx and kind of took it to a whole new level. And like you said, they kind of grew at the same time, um, just in slightly with, with slightly different sounds, but the foundation of how both dancehall and hip hop, their trajectory was very similar. Yeah. You know what you said about toasting. I, I remember you know, watching documentaries and and seeing how you know Grandmaster Flash and some of these DJs they would be playing, um, you know, beats, and then it, different different people would come and rap over those beats, and the same thing, exactly what you just said, the same thing was happening in the dance halls in Jamaica. Um, you know, like we didn't, I don't think, you know, back in the seventies and 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 it wasn't until probably the eighties that. I think the dance hall moniker really stuck, right? Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it, the music essentially was always reggae. You know, it was always that. It was just the fusion, the sound became different because now it went from obviously, you know, musicians to now these these beats that were that were being created the 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 the, the one drop on all these other sounds that that people were that DJs were and producers were coming up with and the same thing was happening like you said the same thing was happening in America you know mm -hmm. and i think the whole when you look at the when you look at both of them they were both born out as as, as we'd say in Jamaica suffocation right mm -hmm. both born out of strife and struggle both born out of uh, this this um, rage against the machine, uh, mm -hmm. uh, against what 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 you know organizations, what corporations, what what government and so forth was doing to the people, a feeling of being downtrodden, and it created this amazing sound. Mm -hmm. But also um, that their joy was an act of rebellion. You know, yes. it, because even through the suffocation you know, with a sing song, how much song about suffocation with a sing because it's oars. We can talk about it proudly. So that's that element of it as well. Like, yes, this is our plight. This is what we're going through, but we're going to enjoy ourselves in the process. And that's what they did, you know. And, and it's just such an interesting way to see how, you know, they're like twins, you know, in a way and just having... um fraternal twins for for a better word you know not identical but they have you know over time intertwined have parallels and you know one twin bigger than the other at this point but you know it's it's important to to talk about that symbiotic you know influence that they experience over the years and i think that that has continued especially when you talk about how intertwined the sounds are now and how the influence it, it it feels like it kind of we're we're doing this song and dance in terms of influence and sounds um you know right now the the idea of trap hall and and how dance hall has evolved and then you add afro beats to the conversation and that becomes a whole you know tree of you know, the foundation is set, but there are, there's like this circular, like you said, sim symbiotic um, 
uh, connection between all of them. But I think that the 80s, and you guys both kind of touched on it as a time frame, it was ripe to really talk about a lot of the issues that were happening. And in that release, there were, were also messages. Um, and both really struggled to overcome and become a genre. What are your thoughts around how both genres have evolved into almost like their own evolving, watching a genre evolve a, a, as it stands to be completely transparent? Because, you know, when we, we were coming up, there were no hip hop charts, at, like hip hop charts were new. So in, a, in essence, we got the privilege of growing up with the genre like what was your experiences like just seeing it evolve we're talking hip-hop right both well again i'm always seeing the parallel so there were no hip-hop charts but chris you go know this there wasn't even a dedicated station for dancehall until the late 90s <laughs> you, you know in jamaica you understand so it's like they both had to tough it to their own legitimacy in their own spaces mm -hmm. and um, to be recognized. Because when we grew up, dance hall, the most time you hear dance hall is when the taxi driver, the plate in a car or the bar, a plate or a session about for keep and dance, a keep, but you wouldn't hear it on radio. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't hear dance hall on radio. And it wasn't until Irie FM came on the scene where you heard dance hall all the time. It was dedicated for dance hall. And when you think of hip hop, they had similar fights. They they were just like, you need to play with music. You know, we deserve to be aired on the Grammys. I remember when they all boycotted. You know, I was listening to hip hop in Jamaica, like all the old school songs, like. I don't know how I knew all the words to self-destruction, but I knew the entire words to this 10 minute song with every rapper back then. And it was really a PSA about crime and violence. And again, when you think about dancehall, how many PSAs do we have about crime and violence? Mm -hmm. You know, put on the gun, stop the this, stop the, like, you know, so it's like, it's born out of the ghetto. And you have to address the issues that are facing the people who live there. And you're also trying to be positive. All these different struggles. And so I just, it, it's, it's, it's a reflection of the different elements of our society in our black community mm -hmm. and different artists addressing those. So, you know, thinking of the party rappers versus the more message driven rappers versus, you know, all these different styles. And at one point dance all had that. I don't think dance all has that now, but in the early, not even early 2000, in the nineties, you had that, you know, like a rapper had a particular style. So we know say, all right, this artist, we know say a peer party tune, peer gal tune, you know, some, hybrid so it's they they both it's it's art and you take on what it, you see in your community and what your vibe is and to see radio stations I, I i think it was just amazing and then at the time when i moved to new york in the the heights of everything jamaican dance hall and hip-hop it was also a crazy thing because at the time when i moved to new york Buju had released his Voice of Jamaica album, which I think is one of his more pop focused album because he had all those collaborations on it. And you could see how he wasn't the first to do it. Shaba would do that more often, but you could see that's when hip hop and dance all kind of started doing a lot more collaboration. And that's how I think for us in the Caribbean that grew a little bit more. Yeah, you know, f for me, <clears throat> looking back, I definitely remember, you know, um, in the 80s, because I was at, like around 1984, I was at KC. You had both Beat Street and Breakin' as films that came out, right? 
Um, like you said, Carrie, you're listening to so in Jamaica, I was listening to hip hop heavy. You know, um, I remember I had a slick rip, slick rick tape. You know, and Slick Rick back then did I talk some things. I mean, I know all my parents did, did never catch me. I listened to that tape there. But anyway, because the things that he was saying on his music, I should not have been listening. But it, but I was I had I had all that stuff. And, you know, uh, for those of you young people who may be listening, they had this thing back in the day called cassettes. That's how we <laughs> listened to music. We had Walkman, we had tape deck, we had all them things there. Anyway, but just kidding. But but seriously, um, you know, so the evolution of that, just watching, first of all, you know, the music, as we say, the similarities, the music was heavily driven by hip hop, was heavily driven by dance, graffiti, um, and, and you know, that graffiti as they dubbed it, but it was, it was art, it was street art. It was us, again, bucking the system, rebelling against the system, raging against the machine. You're not going to tell me what I'm worth. I'm going to show you. And so, yeah, the buildings there, the, the subways there. I remember when I came to America in 1984 and subways and I saw the subways. I was like, oh, my God, what is this? Like, yo, a women dead. <laughs> You know, but I, it wasn't like out of fear. It was more so just understanding what this was. It was it was gritty. It was grimy. It was, you know, but but at the same time, there was art and mm -hmm. it was art. You know, looking back at it now. Yeah. You know, the, those times were dangerous, you know, yeah. but it was a reflection of what people were going through. And so that drove the music. It pushed the music. But also because of what the music was coming from, there were those segments of the population, you know, those, uh, dare I say, elitist segments of the population that wanted to quell that. They wanted to silence it because they're saying, you know, it's it's too violent. It's too, you know, it, it, you know, the, the, they didn't like the sound. They thought it was a departure from what was considered real music. Dancehall and hip hop both faced those challenges. Um, and so, like you said, Carrie, no, you know, radio stations didn't want to play it. And those that did, you know, they were edgy, you know, and they mm -hmm. would run into issues. Um, I knew my, as my dad would tell you, he knew, you know, DJs who, you know, the program director, cause you know, program directors dictated what you played, when you played it, blah, blah, blah. And if you slip one in, you know, you may not be on the air next day or the next few days or permanently, depending on what it is that you slip in. So, you know, but but people started taking more and more chances. And then you, you, you know, once they saw the, the music grew to a point where it could not be silenced. It couldn't be stopped. Hip hop is not only music. It is clothing. It's 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 art. It's it, you, you know, it's films. It's everything. It is a whole culture on its own. And that's what it's me be me being able to experience that to see that uh is amazing and i you know one of the biggest things about this conversation that bothers me is that i feel that dance hall could have achieved that same level of growth uh and i feel like jamaica didn't do what it needed to as a nation to support that you know some people argue and say different but i just feel like you know when i look at both of those genres i feel like dance hall could have what hip hop now has you know it could have that level of it cuz it is great but it could see that greatness financially for the artists for for young people coming into the business to be able to grow and flourish in a way that hip hop has and that's kind of the challenge that i face now with where hip hop is versus dance hall i'm Mr. Carrie ready for me she ready she ready all right before 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 we, we go down that 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 lane there <laughs> let me back up the lane let me back up the lane i i think to add to some of the conversation the other part about that and we'll probably get into this more later i was born in the 80s so and grew up you know with some time in the bronx and i remember distinctly carrie probably knows this you know my mom never let me touch the radio so I only heard what was heard. So I just grew up thinking that reggae was <laughs> normal, that like those, like I just, you know, souls and, you know, a little bit of pop here and there. But it wasn't until like I went to school and was really exposed to hip hop. And I remember distinctly 
hearing Slick Rick and that, like, I fell in love with Slick Rick. And then I start, like, Tribe Called Quest, you know, and then, you know, we have Biggie. And then all, I, I noticed a pattern that when I did the research, a lot of these artists are of Caribbean heritage. So I think that that styling in my mind was there was a connection there for me personally, being a diaspora kid, growing up hearing both sounds. Stylistically, there was just something in the artistry that kind of wove the two together for me. Because without even knowing or doing the research, I would automatically gravitate to a lot of the artists that had Caribbean heritage, unbeknownst to me until after I did the research. But let me come back to Kerry Mekar's statement regarding the status of um, dancehall and, and hip hop. <laughs> if you can see Kerry face, you know. <laughs> she going to roast me. No, I'm not roast you, Bridget, because it's a legitimate argument. But my counter to that is hip hop didn't have governmental intervention if anything they had senators one remember luke who is of caribbean heritage had to go fight for his first amendment right you understand what i'm saying they were putting down cds and cassettes and they roll over them right so the government didn't help hip-hop get it to where it was the artists them come together boycott the grammys they they supported luke they support you understand they did that on their own so to expect the Jamaican government to do that for one, they were out of their depth to do that, right? Because they are considered a developing country, right? They did have, you know, like there, there, there were different things that would try to package culture. So remember, reggae sun splash was a thing for years, right? That's how you got tourist dollars in, but if we look at the differences between dancehall or reggae or hip hop, Michaela, we talk about this all the time. In music, even in acting, at some point the perform the performer graduates to be the producer, the record label owner, to all these other things that show growth and maturity. We don't have that in dancehall. I really, what I'm hoping for is that you know, as more uh, of these uh, conferences and so forth take place, um, more of these conversations take place and more of the the industry uh, is more of the industry leaders are talking. We'll start to see, you know, the growth uh, that is required. I think dance hall and hip hop are on a trajectory uh, together. They have always been. I don't think there's any way that can be denied or or even shaken right um i just feel like i'm hope i'm i'm remaining hopeful that things will improve for dancehall as a as 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 a genre um that it can see more growth and more development similar to what hip hop has seen in the last uh decade and a half or two you know or two there you have it, folks. I think we talked a lot about the the foundation and how you know reggae and hip hop uh, and dancehall are are related in a lot of great ways. Um, I think keeping the foundational aspects and and mentioning the historical pieces is important to those, especially who are new coming into the genre, to really understand. Um, I think history as a whole is something that we should always pay attention to so that we can actually learn from one another and not necessarily repeat the same mistakes, but kind of grow together. Um, but I think there are a lot of really great examples um, of collaboration. And I think that there will continue to be more. Um, we talk a lot about parties and energy and we often are in spaces where all black music is played so i think that that is where we'll continue to see growth um in community um in, in terms of the dance hall the party that aspect is never going to change and i think 
those will always have, we're just going to add more um, diaspora genre, black genres together. I think we're still going to see how those evolve as well. Um, but I'm excited to really see what the next 50 really look like. Um, and, uh, just I'm here for the ride. That's it. You know, we're going to be. Wait, so you live to a hundred. I was oh, about absolutely. to say. Absolutely. Yes, I All am. All right. Yes. No, listen, yes. may I live, may I live to a hundred and twenty five. I am so living to a hundred. I put that out there all the time. I'm like, I'm going to live to a hundred. Yes. I'm going to have my good, good knees at 85. I go down. I go down. I go down. But not so far. Not so far. Yeah, yes, it. <laughs> at least I hope so. So until next time, you guys, stay tuned for the next episode. We're going to be talking about hip-hop and reggae dancehall collabs. Until next time, thank you so much, Chris and Carrie. But Leah, Tommy peeps. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of the Style and Vibes podcast. If you like what you hear, and I know you do, share it with your friends and family. If you want more, make sure you visit styleandvibes.com and follow us on our social channels, Twitter and Instagram at Style and Vibes. Until next time, Leah Tommy peeps. <laughs>